I was 800 pounds, not able to get off the ground, peeing in the floor, needing assistance in every way, shape, and form of my life. Literally a handicapped vegetable. I was a man child. It's like a human block. You think change is hard in your life? Try losing 600 pounds. In today's episode, I talked to Casey King, the man featured on the TLC show, Family by the Ton. TLC show, it's a reality show. It's a hyper-focused viewing of my life. And I was unhappy. I was irritable. I was annoyed constantly. There were people in my family that fully knew at moments of time that I was on a diet. They would show up with full trays of red velvet cookies. And then I was on camera. I was 30 years old and my dad was still helping me put on shoes and socks and helping me bathe. And that's not the way your life is supposed to be. Now that I lost the weight, started getting DMs on Instagram telling me I'm attractive, calling me handsome, calling me gorgeous, all these things that I'd never heard. Because all that was new to me, I only wanted to lose more weight. When we started talking and I said, you know, that there's this quote, be yourself, and if you're a shitty person, change. And you responded talking about addiction. And I think we both know how powerful the addiction of food can be. Yeah. We can dig into that. Um, you talked about, you know, as long as you're not being a pity person to other people. Uh, in your story, anyone who knows your story, you know, you and your dad's relationship is a huge part of it. Yeah. If we go back to the 12 years you spent in isolation, uh, you know, the 600, 700, 800 pounds you became, were you not, was that version of you not a pity person though? How do, how do you rationalize was. that? It, it was, I can't, there's a whole weird, like hard to like unravel dynamic between like me and my dad now. Like it's a lot like, so people that watch the show fully say that I blame my dad for being, for me being overweight. That's not the case. I was born big. I like to eat throughout my life. I got big, but like you would I use the word enabler. I still stand by that word. And anyone that would argue with me, if I was addicted to heroin and someone was bringing in heroin for me to t- to use, they would call that person an enabler. I would. I, I'm not blaming my dad for the food addiction. I'm just saying that, like, and it wasn't even just my dad. There were other people in my family that fully knew at moments of time that I was on a diet and it was going well, and they would show up at family gatherings with full trays of red velvet cookies with cream cheese icing in them. And I'm like, Hey guys, I lost 50 pounds in four months. And they're like, Oh my God, I deep fried this Turkey and then injected it with honey and syrup. You're going to love it. And I'm like, that's okay. I got, I guess that's going to be fun to eat when I'm trying to lose weight. I just, I use the word enabler with my dad. Very hard for people to take that. Was my relationship with my dad bad? It was. I because was of you full, or because of him? Because of me. Like, I don't blame him for even being an enabler because the only thing that made me happy was food and video games. Um, I had an addiction to gaming because I had a lifestyle that fit that addiction. I was very sedentary. I didn't go a lot of places. I didn't do a lot of things. My one escape from, from the world was games and it became an addiction, but it became an addiction through my food addiction. Um, I was a man child in, in some ways I still am. I haven't overcome a lot of stuff. Um, I was probably manipulative. I was a baby. I whined about things. I just wanted food. I knew he liked to eat. I knew I could play off him wanting to eat into getting me food. I knew he liked to eat certain foods. I knew uh, if I acted a certain way, I would get food. I knew that if I said, did the wanted to do these things, we'd get food. It was all based upon me. I just used the word enabler because it's just simply the definition of what he was. But I was the reason that I was in that bad addiction because I just fell into it like and embraced it. Once the snowball started rolling into that lifestyle, there's no like, oh, Casey, just hit the gym. When you're 550 pounds, you're not just going to go to the gym. Um, And then you're in this downward spiral that's only going to get worse because no one's stepping in to help you Um, because everyone around you that you directly have contact with is enabling you, but that's only because they love you and they want you happy. And they know that food makes you happy. Um, I don't ask for uh, people to forgive 
me for the way I was on the show. I will say it was a TLC show. It's a hyper focused, uh, you know, viewing of my life. It's not a documentary. It's a reality show. Also, there's a lot of other things people don't like, and I'm not excusing anything I did. Um, but my life before TLC, wake up at noon, eat a ridiculous amount of food, play video games all day, um, eat again, maybe take a shower at some point or bathe somehow, go to the bathroom a couple of times, sit back in my bed, play more video games or sit in the living room. That's it. TLC came in. Casey, we need you up at six o'clock in the morning, showered and ready at this location to film. It was a complete, like, I don't even still want to say 360. It was like a full triple backflip turnaround of my life schedule. And I was not a morning person because I was used to sleeping until 12. I wasn't used to being active. And then I was all of a sudden being active. I was used to eating what I want. Now I'm dieting. It was literally like I was detoxing and coming off a really an actual addiction to something else because I just would go through mood swings. I was unhappy. I was irritable. I was annoyed constantly. My anxiety was through the roof. I was a shitty person. And it was, and then I was on camera. And of course, they're like, let's film this guy when he's upset because they know I'm upset. Also, I'm loud. And I have a pretty short, somewhat fuse. But like I, so the weird, the funny thing is I try to blow up and be like comical about it. But when you're on TV and you're in that kind of like, already really bad toxic dynamic, nothing is funny. Anytime I made a joke, anytime I said anything, anytime anything was meant like not to be taken literal, it was taken literal. Like there are still people to this day that comment on YouTube clips, my Instagram posts, my YouTube videos, uh, everything about how I was TikTok, how I was on the show, like to the, okay. Perfect example. To this day, there are people reacting to videos of me bathing on the back porch. And every single time there's 150 comments or more that say, why is he bathing with dish soap? And I know that like people just don't understand that like we didn't have bubble bath because I didn't always bathe outside. They showed up on a random day and they were like, we need bubbles. So he's not, we can't see his like groin and the genitals underwater. So we'll just put dish soap in there. So we just put dish soap in it. Like it, it blows my mind. The things that the internet pays attention to. And if it was just a heroin addiction, people would say that or meth or whatever, they would say I was mean, or, but they would be like, well, I mean, he wasn't at it, but because it's food, it's so spoken about like haphazardly. And so like blase blah, it's just like, I mean, he was just overweight. Why is he a piece of shit? Meanwhile, if I was like addicted to cocaine or crack or something else, they'd be like, I mean, it is a drug addiction. It's pretty hard. Like, I just don't, I, I, in my head, addiction is addiction. I'm not asking for forgiveness, but I would like a little bit from people of being like, oh, he is human. And he was in this terrible spot of his life. And he was probably super depressed, borderline suicidal. So like, maybe he was a piece of shit because he was living an awful existence, but that's not at all what they think about. That's not what they consider. I was just a piece of shit. Cause I like food. That's literally what <laughs> their one, two connection is. He was fat. He was an asshole. He was a piece of shit. Cause he couldn't get fatter. And that's like their one to one to two comparison line of thought for me. How's your relationship with your dad now? It's still got, it's like issues. Um, there's a weird thing that happens when someone sees you and you're most vulnerable. Uh, I mean, I was 30 years old and my dad was still like helping me put on shoes and socks and helping me bathe and stuff. And that's not the way your life is supposed to be. And now I'm not in that shape, but he's seen me in my literal worst. Like people watch the show if it had been a documentary, it would have been so much more blurred and disgusting and bad from the bad times in my life. Uh, the other thing, uh, the one thing I also want to add is TLC stepped in at the better part of my weight journey. Like I was 800 pounds, not able to get off the ground, literally peeing in the floor, literally like needing assistance in every way, shape and form of my life. When TLC walked in, I was already, I'd already lost weight, regained weight, and I was just 700 pounds. I wasn't even really bathing outside anymore. We did that because 
when I was casted to be on the show, that was something I had to go through. And they're basically trying to do a look back at your worst moments and then put them on TV so people can see how bad it was. But at that time, it wasn't that bad. If TLC had stepped in when it was bad, people would have literally thought I was like a human blo- like blob, like literally a handicapped vegetable that was taken care of by my father in every step of the way. So when a person sees you at your literal worst and your most vulnerable, it takes down this like protection you feel there's this resentment now that I have for my dad and I can't, I need to go to counseling. I need to go to therapy. Um, honestly, cause like I can't work through it because now that I've become an individual and I've become like more of a self-sufficient person, anytime any of that is taken from me, I revert back to this, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing? Like, I'm able, I'm capable. I don't need you to do this for me. I get so defensive and so angry and it, it causes a lot of anxiety in me. I mean, there's so many things that I'm able to do now that I wasn't. And anytime any of that individuality or like responsibility or my like person is taken from me, I'm, so quickly taken back to like, why are you doing this to me? I'm so defensive. No, listen, man, I think that what you're actually sharing is 100% normal and we all experience it, but we don't almost notice it. And if I can share a real quick story. So when the pandemic happened a few years ago and we kept going in and out of lockdown, I loved lockdown. (laughs) I thought it was like, an excuse to be alone and for people to leave me alone. And it was great. And my wife hated it. She felt like her freedom was taken. Her connection was taken. She felt like um, like it was honestly the worst time of her life. And then we would come out of lockdown and she'd be like, oh, thank goodness. And anytime anyone mentioned anything or we had to go into a second lockdown or a third one, she would just unravel. Yeah. And I was asking her, like I was trying to watch this as it happened and try to figure out why is this? Now, my wife... Uh, was a stay-at-home mom for like 14 or 15 years. And while she was at home for those 14 or 15 years, putting her life on hold, putting her dreams on hold, she felt like she didn't have a lot of purpose. She didn't have a lot of things. She didn't have her own thing. She was being a mom. She was being a wife. And what we realized is every time that this little hint of freedom was being taken away, or anytime I'd have to travel for work, or anytime... She felt this pressure as if her life was backsliding to the person that she was and it was being taken away from her. And it created this fight or flight mode because she's like, it's almost PTSD. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be stuck there. And it happens so quick. And so I think what you're describing is what I watched in her and I I hear you saying is like, you are not that person, but it, it was so, it wasn't that long ago, right? And yeah. so anytime that anyone, anytime that you get that little whiff of someone treating you the way you were as opposed to who you are today and who you're becoming, um, it, it's gonna put you into fight or flight mode because you're like, fuck no, man, I don't wanna go back to that. Stop treating me like this and you're gonna be yeah. really sensitive to it. I've created, I don't wanna say an identity for myself, but yeah, an identity for myself. And like, I've become this person I am. And it's still new to me, to other people, to friends and family or whatever. And it's something that I'm somewhat proud of in a lot of ways. And I you should be proud of it though, no? Like no, fully. But what I what sucks is because it's so new, it's still hard sometimes for even my mom and my dad to like know things that I would think or say. So they'll offer me something or they'll say something or we'll have a conversation. And then they'll come out of left field saying something. And I'm like, why would you even say that to me? You know, like, you know me. But then like in my head, I don't even realize that like, well, they might not. They might not know these things about me because all this stuff is like new. You know, at one point we, I didn't have opinions on things. I I didn't have reasons to do things. I didn't have a schedule or time to be anywhere. So like, they don't know that like I would never order this or I would never go do this or I'm not interested in this or I would never say that or, you know, like they don't know that because like, why would they? They're not in my head. And this person that I'm becoming is literally only like four years out, three years out. Like, it's not like I've been this way for 30 years. It's, you know, I I don't even think my mom or my dad know my favorite color. 
And that's not a shot at them. That's just like, it, I, we don't, I, I haven't even really uh, like told them that or like what my favorite movie is. All these things that like I feel and say and or like, you know, they know my personality. They know I'm funny. My mom literally just thinks I'm going to say the most outrageous thing to make her laugh ever. Like they know my personality because I've always been that person. But like there are more intricate details of me that they probably don't know because they're all it's literal all new to them because they didn't yeah. for, you know, there's 12 years of my life that are basically I won't say 12, 10 years of my life that are like day to day, almost the same thing. Wake up, food, games, uh, more games, shower uh, or bathe, uh, food, games, go to sleep. You are a perfect example of someone who has changed almost every aspect of you. And you're speaking to how hard it is for you to change, for you to know who you are, for what you like and don't like, how hard it is for people in your life who knew you a certain way to get to know you, this new version of you and change. And it's just so fucking hard. Yeah. And so um, I'd be curious about some of the lessons you've learned along the way. But first, I, you know, I almost have to, I, I feel compelled to ask, do you feel tired of being... Um, the freak or the circus sideshow. You know, you went on a reality TV show. You were really large. I think that we can learn from all of your lessons that you've learned and how much you've changed. But I'm sure there's a whole host of people who are out there who are just like, like you talked about, why is he bathing in dish soap? Where they're just here for kind of the circus show. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's. So when I was a kid, I always wanted to be like, no, I wanted to be not. I mean, famous. I like to be seen. I like to be listened to. It's fun. It's nice. It's great. Um, but there's a point when you get the same question 37. Like at first, when the show first came out, it was literal 13 year olds every single day adding me on Snapchat and Instagram, DMing me and asking me if I still play Fortnite. Every single day, 20 kids. Yo, man, let's game up Fortnite. What's your game attack? Fortnite, Fortnite. You used to play. And then it was um, the baiting outside, um, the, uh, you know, why are you an asshole to everyone around? Like, I've gotten so many questions repeatedly. There's a point to where I want a different legacy for myself. Uh, I would like to be known not for the guy that was huge, but merely for the guy that changed his life. He's funny. You should look, listen to him. He's fun to talk to, this kind of thing. But I uh, I'm not proud of getting to that level, but I'm pretty proud of the way I've turned things around. Uh, there's a lot of people that are given an opportunity like that and they just squander it and they don't take advantage of it. And so what did you do? You talked about all the people who weren't successful on the show. And if you look at the biggest loser statistics, the vast majority of people who went through the program gained a lot of, if not more of the weight back than they lost. But what did you do that led to your success that so many other people didn't do? So it might just be that I'm a one of one in a lot of ways to where I didn't experience a lot of things in life that now that I'm now that I lost the weight, I don't even, it's so, okay. Never dated in high school, never had a girlfriend, went on a couple of like friend dates. Cause I liked the girl, but she was my friend. And I was like, I have a chance with her. Meanwhile, it ends in a handshake. It was never a kiss coming or anything because they were friends. And I didn't know liking someone, liking them between like just wanting to be their friends. I didn't know. So then I become a blob and then I lose weight. And now dating apps are a thing. Some girl, some comment on YouTube was like, he's kind of cute. Then on TikTok, it was like, he's kind of cute. I like his face. Then someone was like, I like his sense of humor. He's funny. Then I started getting DMs on Instagram that said I was cute and attractive. Because all that was new to me, I only wanted to lose more weight. I <laughs> like the habit I, loop, the habit loop. It's a feedback. It's good. Yeah. Like it's, it, oh, fully. Yeah. Like I have always, I, even when my friends and my family falter, I have social media and then like, in, like YouTube comments random people on dating apps, adding me, wanting to match with me, telling me I'm attractive, calling me handsome, calling me hot, calling me gorgeous, calling me fine, saying like all these things that I had never heard. And I was like, what, when did this start? What are you, what, what, what I'm attractive. And like, once it started, I was like, well, 
we're just going to keep losing weight. And then I got also like an, there's an appreciation for like hiking for me now. Like I like hiking. I like going outside. I've always been like uh, drawn towards water. I've always liked swimming. Luckily I live near there where there's a huge falls and there's a river that runs beside these hiking trails. So I love it. Like if there's a place I can go walking near water, I'm always down for that because I, even though I'm a ginger, I hate the sun, but like I enjoy being outdoors and cranking out a couple of miles and being covered in sweat. You know, I, there's just something about it now that I enjoy that I didn't. My habits changed eating wise. My it's, certain things became more important and more of a drug for me than other things used to be. I probably now have more of an addiction towards I don't want to say women because it's not like I'm a serial date or dating everyone, but I have an, a, I do have a drug for attention. I have a drug for like um, conversation with new people. I have a social drug. I love getting out there and talking to people. I mean, I don't do drugs at all. I barely drink, uh, literally can't stand or uh, the taste or the smell of weed um, and alcohol. I don't like beer. I'm very lucky and all that. My addiction is for like social aspects of life, going out and doing things, being around people, energy vibes. If I go to a thing and I meet someone new, like say I'm in a group of like 10 and three of them are laughing at me. I can't explain how good it feels. And I just won't be able to stop talking. Like I will only turn up my personality more and more. I will only try to be more funny and be more social because those three people that don't know me have now like, they like me and I can't stop. Can't you, you do know that's a problem though, right? Like, oh, it's like, so like listen, a problem. replacing it's one addiction that's about to kill you for another addiction that's uh, just about to make a fool of you. That's great. Like, let's go ahead and keep changing addictions from things yeah. that, as opposed to eating ourselves to death. Uh, yeah. Now it's just like, oh, I made a bit of a, an ass of myself. Well, um, l- luckily, it doesn't ever, like I, I know how to like turn off. I like, I know how to like stop because I don't want to overpower a conversation. I, 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 even though I feel like I've done that here, but you're like talking to me and asking <laughs> these questions. I can't stop. I don't want to make it to where a person feels like they can't give feedback. They can't tell me about their life. I'm very much a person that plays down everything I've went through because my struggle doesn't diminish someone else's. Like there's a lot of people that message me and they'll say, Hey, you know, uh, you know, you're a big inspiration. I, you know, uh, I haven't been on the same journey as you, but I lost, you know, 120 pounds over the last two years. And I just want to say thanks to you. I know it's not as much as you lost. Uh, you know, I was 250 pounds. Now I'm, you know, 140 and, you know, I look totally different. It's crazy. But I, you know, I know it's not as much as you would do. And I'm like, bro, do you understand that? Like, Losing a hundred, I mean, that not all of everything I just said was factual. I'm just giving you a scenario because someone's going to be like, you can't lose 120 pounds over two years when you weigh 250. But people will message me and they'll legit have lost like 60 pounds over a year or two years. And I'm like, hey, man, that's great. Like, the only reason I lost an immense amount of weight was because I was huge. I'm now at 250 and I struggle to lose five pounds. When you're 250 or 300, it's hard to lose weight. So like when you're losing substantial amounts, like 60 pounds, bro, that's a fifth of your weight. You should be ecstatic. That's really great. You did something that's phenomenal. Don't diminish your journey because of my like terrible situation I was in. You did a great thing for you. That's amazing. Like kudos, good job. You should be more proud of yourself than I am of me because you're you and I'm me. We're two different people. You shouldn't be more proud of my accomplishments when you've done things yourself. I've got to ask, because I lost some weight on my own journey too. I was never really athletic or fit or anything like that. And then from my heaviest to my lightest, I, I lost about 70 pounds. Um, I'm about nope. 20, 25 pounds heavier now than I was at my lightest. So I put some back on. But um, one thing that always bothered me, <laughs> I talked to my wife about this. Too. One thing that always bothered me is whenever I was losing weight, you know, you're like eating and you're exercising and you're in the zone and you're on the scale and you're feeling better and you're feeling confident. And you're like, 
week after week, month after month. And you're like, you've got this. And you're like, ah, I look amazing, especially compared to who I am. And then I'd like put on a bathing suit and I'd go to like a water park or something. Uh, and I'd, be like, I'd be like, damn, I'm still a fat guy. Like no, <laughs> yeah, all look, these yeah. people who are meeting me, they don't realize how much I lost. <laughs> it's okay. The world. People appreciate people, right? Short people appreciate tall people because they don't know what it's like to be tall. And then tall people appreciate really tall people because you're like, you think I'm tall. I'm six foot one. That dude's six foot nine. He's tall. And I hate to say it, fat people appreciate fatter people because they don't look as fat around other fat people. I think with clothes on, I can look okay. We're all right. I know how to dress. I have a little bit of style. I'm okay. Put me in a like board shorts at the beach. I'm an absolute shit show. And I'm so self-conscious that I don't even want to be there. Like, I don't even really like swimming around my friends and family without my shirt on. I do it because I do trust them. And like, I, you know, know they're not going to say anything to hurt me. And I feel I, the vulnerability I allow myself around them is usually pretty safe, but like, I get it. Like, I think I'm okay. But then I go around someone else. That's like, hell, there could be someone that's six foot 300 pounds, but they work out. They're going to look toned as shit. Whereas I'm 50 pounds less than them. And I'm going to look like a dumpster fire because of, the skin and how my body still looks and all this stuff. Like it, it's just, it's hard. How do you balance the like, yes, fuck yes. I'm proud of how far I've come and, and you're a totally different person. But then on the other side go like, oh, there's still these things I don't like about myself. I'm pretty hard on myself and self-conscious and like self-conscious in a lot of ways. Um, I don't like the way I look. I now lean into the fact that when other people compliment me or say things to me, they think it. So, so on some basis of reality, it's true. Like, ah, that's great. Beethoven. I, I'm going to speak very loosely here. He probably didn't think anything he made was that great because we are always like our harshest critics, but there are people that like love everything he ever put together. There are literal painters and the musicians and comedians and movie stars that never think they make anything great. But there are people that pay tons of money to go see them perform, to go see their movies in theater, to go see these bands play live, to go listen to the music, to go see the art. Like people enjoy what they enjoy you're always going to be hardest on yourself. You're always going to be your hardest critic. So you have to lean into the fact that like, just because you don't see it, other people might. Like when I was a kid and I was trying to look at those stupid magic eyes, there was a long time where I couldn't do it. And I was like, how do they see something that I can't see? And then if you just adjust your eyes, right. And you go cross at it in just the right amount of time, like the right, area you can start to see what they're seeing and as soon at some point you're like wait a minute this is there they all thought this whole time so it had to have been there so you just have to lean into the thoughts and the words and the opinions of other people because they believe it so you should it may not be there for you to see like i still don't think you know there's only a couple things about me that i'm really confident in i don't think i'm a, a great looking guy i do think i'm funny I do think I've got a pretty good personality. And those are like the two things that I lean into a lot. But when someone starts to tell me attractive, call me attractive, I'm not going to be like, I'm kind of an ugly bag of shit. Like if they think I'm attractive, they think I'm attractive. There are people that like well done steaks. I think they're insane, but they like it. You know, British they like people it. like well done steaks. I think it's called burnt. <laughs> yeah. And they like that though. There are people that literally like black licorice and that is, Oh, I come on. It. Black licorice is great. It's so bad. You no, know, it's actually, if you want a, a nice healthy dessert, you can always go for some fennel or some anise, right? Like the, the celery-like thing that tastes like black licorice. It's amazing. I literally have never had fennel in my life, and I don't even know the other thing you said. Uh, it's the same thing. It's just, I, I think it depends on where you are in the world. You call it something different. Anise. anise, I think it's called. Anise or fennel. Same thing. I don't know if they sell that at Ingles here where we live, which is the grocery <laughs> store, but they might, they definitely don't sell it at Piggly Wiggly. Actually they might, who knows? But like, you just have to lean into the opinions of other people. 
if someone tells you some people like lemon pepper wings, some people like hot wings. You have to lean like their opinion is their opinion. If they think you're attractive, if they think you're good looking, if they think you're funny, then that's all that really matters. So for all of our listeners and um, and even of the viewers who haven't seen you on the show, you're I've heard you say you're carrying around 20 pounds of extra skin that um, that you've been talking for what a year or two now about the skin removal surgery. Uh, yeah. What's going on with that? What's taking so long? Is it a finance thing or is it a, is it a health thing or or are you just scared? <laughs> it's it's scared and finance. Um, yeah, tell so, me about the surgery. What, what does this mean? What happens? Um, so there's, I saw at one point, probably last year, I think it was last year. I went and saw about five, uh, bariatric skin removal people in Atlanta. Um, I had pretty much decided kind of who I think, who I thought I was going to go with because of, uh, so I have this, you can't see it, but I have this, uh, pelvic bone and not pelvic. Is it pelvic? Yeah. Your pelvic's your chest, right? Whatever. And it's called your xiphoid process. It's cartilage but it sticks out because all of my like muscle or whatever that should protect it has now moved because of the substantial weight loss. He was the only guy that addressed it. He said he would shave it down. And I mean, it literally protrudes out of my chest, like without a shirt on, it's like an elbow kind of bone coming right in between like my uh, left and right uh, pecs or whatever you would call them. Um, And I, I was pretty sure I was going to go with him. Then there were some things popped up where like I randomly got interviewed by TMZ and then the production company from TLC uh, that filmed the show in Atlanta got in touch with me and they were like, so what's going on with you? Tell us all these things. And I was like, well, I'm looking into skin removal, blah, blah, blah. Then I found out I had three hernias, uh, one in my belly button and one in my left and right groin. I had to have them fixed before skin removal. Uh, but then uh, the TLC people were like, well, maybe we'd help you with skin removal on the show. So that put that into a long pause. Uh, and then I had to have surgery. Uh, I had to pay for that. Bariatric skin removal is paid for by your insurance because it's a quality of life uh, surgery. The problem is most bariatric skin removal surgeons in Atlanta from what I found, do not take insurance because the insurance companies will find a way to skip out on certain like price uh, bills and things you have to pay for. So they demand that if you want that, uh, they, well, they don't demand, they say, if you want this, you have to pay person wise. Like there's no insurance you can use. Yeah. So how much uh, is that? So I'm going to have two surgeries. Uh, They really only give you a quote on the first surgery from the lowest, it would probably be like twenty five, twenty five thousand dollars. Um, and then the second surgery, I'm gonna guess would probably be around seventeen to twenty because it wouldn't be as many things. Well, it would be on different areas of my body, but they probably wouldn't have to do so much. Uh, they just would. Ha- it would all be based on how much they could actually do on the first surgery and how everything came looking out. Almost no matter what, I would still want the second surgery because I know they can't do my top and bottom both at the same time. They have yeah. to do both. And well, I well, want you have, a, you have a GoFundMe that has almost twenty thousand dollars range. So. Yeah, and I ha- and I have that money. Um, Ethan Klein put that together, and I really do appreciate him. I wish we could have spoke a little more before he had made it, so I could have given him more accurate like numbers of like, hey, this is really what this is going to cost. When we, because we, he said it for 15 and I, listen, I don't, it's a hard thing with the internet because like, I don't want to seem like I'm asking for money. I don't want it to look like I'm asking for a handout. And then when someone does something good for you and they're like, Hey, let's start a GoFundMe. It got it to a lot of money. It was before I had even spoke to a surgeon and had any idea of how much it was going to cost. So now it capped, it finished. I've collected that money. It's in like a credit union account where I had all money, I had other money saved, but I still don't have the money for the first surgery or the second surgery. And they would literally need to be like back to back. Plus I won't be working for any of this time. So if all my money goes to that, I will have this surgery and then basically come out possibly jobless and then also broke. And it was just, and I'm just terrified of it. It scares the shit out of me. I've only had two surgeries in my life. 
hernia surgery and the stomach surgery. So yeah. And then there was the whole like still thing looming over my head of like possibly being on another TLC thing, which that is still a possibility from the news I've heard over the past like couple of days. But like without knowing that, can I, I mean, I can't schedule the surgery for tomorrow. It would be months away, but I don't know if they want to be involved in that or not. It's just a whole lot of like, I don't, and this other stupid point, I'm really new to being an adult and having to make phone calls and check my email. And I know that's such a just stupid, awful excuse, but like literally you like your person that was uh, trying to get in touch with me when she hit me up on, I think she originally may have emailed me or maybe did Instagram, but like people message me on Twitter to do things. And I'm like, I don't even check this. Oh man. Uh, I've so enjoyed this conversation. I feel like I've learned a lot because more than anything you've gone through again, the, the most amount of change out of anyone that I think uh, I've ever seen in such a short amount of time. And you are sharing just how hard it is. Like it is really fucking hard. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm really though curious for you at the end of the day, when, when we're thinking about life, when we're thinking about love, when we're thinking about just day by day, what is the most important thing to you? Just try and be happy. Like try and be happy, try and do what makes you happy. Try and find happiness in your existence in life, um, you know, within reason of other people's happiness, don't go out there and rob people because that makes you happy because that will, you know, completely infringe upon their happiness and their quality of life. Just do find things you enjoy doing and do them. You're only going to get one life forever that we know of. And it's literally only going to matter the fun you had, the time you had, and the things you did. You can't take anything to your grave. Anything except for a, a decent suit in a, in a wooden box, maybe a marble box, or you get burnt up, whatever. But like the only thing everyone's going to have from you in the end is the memories and the times you had with them, really. But even if you leave a million dollars to someone in your will, that will get blown. The memories, the legacy you leave behind is all you have all you have so just try and enjoy and have fun